Oh, we have a three-time British Open champion, three-time master. So I got these clubs on my birthday, 18th of July, and I went down and played my first round of golf. If you're engrossed in doing something, you can overcome it. I think there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that we get to hear with Sir Nick, and now we get to bring it to all you guys, and that is gonna be super cool. Yeah. You've got to enjoy it, and you've got to, and you've got to look after yourself. The same as being a golfer. What you're saying is actually like a huge problem in golf. Is there's this whole other piece of the game, which is arguably like- It's more important. Way more the, important. The mm -hmm. flight and where it's gonna finish. The great thing about golf and the hardest thing after when you stop playing, golf is totally goal orientated. From the minute you arrive on the range, even that first wedge shot should have a goal. Oh, there's a flag down the hill. And so you make 200 goals in a day. All right, guys, here we are, Performance Golf Podcast. Eric and Donnie from Performance Golf. We're here with six-time major champion, former number one golfer in the world for almost 100 weeks. Uh, we have a three-time British Open champion, three-time master. The Open. The Open. The uh, Don't get that wrong well, on the I, first well, day. Back in the day, <laughs> when back in the day, it was the British Open when I first won, then it went to the, op open, the open Championship. Now it's the Open. The Open. You heard him there, Sir Nick Faldo. Sir Nick, appreciate you being here with us today. Sure. Good to be with you guys. Yeah, looking forward to uh, some, some conversations here today. We're going to do a little Sir Nick um, history today. We're going to talk through some key events that happen in Sir Nick's playing career and broadcasting career. And I think in episodes to come, really one of our goals here is to be able to help a lot of the, the viewers. Obviously, we want to hear some stories and your perspective on things, both playing and commentating. We're going to do some uh, different swing reviews as we go, Donnie, some uh, some pro swings, really help you guys play better, some education, some entertainment, and uh, and get some perspective. We're so lucky to have Sir Nick here to get his perspective on on everything. So you want to dive right into some of the history stuff? Yeah, let's dive right in. I think there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that we get to hear with Sir Nick and now we get to bring it to all you guys and that is going to be super brain. cool. Yeah. Dangerous. We'll we need to we need memories. to turn back the clock though oh, because absolutely. yeah. Do you know that clock's 50 that's more than that. It's 52 years ago when I started playing golf. Holy smokes. Two years. I wasn't even being Eric and I, our parents weren't even <laughs> thinking about having us and you were yeah. playing professional yeah. golf about to be winning. You were winning majors before I was born. Just. When I was just July, before I was July born. 87. Okay, no, I was I was born a couple months before. Oh, there that, you go. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> well, that, that leads us into where I'd like to start. And I, I heard this and I want to confirm it's true. It's honestly, it might be one of the most wild golf stats that I've heard. Is it true that you started playing, dun, 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 that you started <laughs> playing golf when you were 14 yeah. And you played in a Ryder Cup by the time you were 20. Six years went by from Six when you years. first started to when How you played that? the Ryder Cup. How about that? So, yeah. So, do you, want the, you want to take the clock back. So, you know, it all started, um, you know, I loved my sport at school. I was good at everything apart from gymnastics. I couldn't throw myself around. And, and it was all really down to either the coaching or the, or the training. So, you know, I... Did all the obvious school sports. You know, I, in, I was in goal at soccer, so that was terrible because the ball used to go through that gap. So that wasn't good. I, I was a good bowler at cricket. What else did I used to do? I was decent. I used to do the 800 meter running. I used to do the discus. Um, what else did I do? I was a very good swimmer um, for quite a while. I was the county boys, under 10s breaststroke champion. And, wow. Uh, yeah, but, That's and a from stat. my reward, my reward. So I won that at Stevenage, breaststroke. And the, and the dreaded reward was you went to Crystal Palace, which was basically our only Olympic sized swimming pool, and went for a three day swimming gala, whatever they call it, you know. The, and I hated it. And I went down the first length. I'd never been in a 50 meter pool. And I lifted my head, of course, after where, where the heck is the end? And there was. 200 kids in there and there's waves there was waves and it i took a full mouthful straight away first length <laughs> so for three days i hated it and i nearly i ne I'm a, i nearly drowned on the last length because i was laughing so hard that was this finally over <laughs> and i and i was never that did me in from swimming so i hated the, the training oh i did cycling out of school uh, i actually enjoyed that i was actually good at that because i got you know big powerful legs i enjoyed it on the track I used to do the track stuff and then, um, and then funny enough, 
I then won a spot. We have a thing called Outward Bound in Britain, which was, um, and I went all the way up to Bonnie Scotland, actually not to Scotland, up to Oldswater in the Lake District. Oh my God, first time I've been away really from my parents. We went for four weeks. That's trained. where they drop you off. They like drop Literally, you off in you, the woods, where you, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you go up, where we, yeah. you trained up, that was big. You arrived at Oldswater in the middle of nowhere. It was April and um, it's still there. I, actually, I tell you, I, I went past it a couple of years ago and, and called in just on the, and so we, I did that for four weeks and that was pretty tough because it's the first time you're in a dorm with other guys. And then we did we did two weeks about all you did, you know, you had to go down and jump in. We had to say freezing cold showers in the morning. I mean, really cold. Because we, in case we now you, know that was really well, good. Yeah, for you. Go, yeah just in case you <laughs> fell in the, the lake. So because you did canoeing and all sorts and camping and assault courses. So I'm loving it. And then after two weeks, we had to go out on actually we were out on mountain rescue patrol. We were we were on 24 hour alert. Mountain rescue. And then we got a real blooming rescue. We were called out. These, you imagine in a coach, we, off we go, four in the morning in a coach to go off and, and to try and find somebody who's lost in the fells and this sort of thing. Because <laughs> back in the day, you didn't have this to go, hello, I'm here. <laughs> so this person had gone that way and was already at the police station. Well, we've gone that way for two, literally for two days to find somebody. Oh, my gosh. All right. And then because it snowed then. So you can tell it was a really cool adventure. It was amazing. It was great. And so, um, how old are you at that time? I'm only You're 16. Young. I'm 16. And okay. but the, but the bad bit was I came back from that after not cycling for four weeks, and all of a sudden phew, the guys had gone, and it was like, oh, so now cycling was, I was not great. I was, I'd lost my, you know, I, I wasn't part of the pack. So, um, so that went out the window. So anyway, so that's a long way of saying that then. I'm watching the Masters, 1971, and it, you know, Jack didn't win. Cootie won it, but Jack finished third or something as usual. And that was the that was the spark. It was like, oh wow, look at that! Oh, green. What are those green fairways and all those lovely trees? I love trees. You've never touched oh, so a you golf haven't played club. Up no, You've I've never, never been no. on a golf course. No, no I don't Your even know. Family, what, there was no golf. I, I we had my granddad on my mum's side. I gave me gave me a, a hickory club. A hickory but I didn't, club. but I didn't know it was a golf club. I used it as an axe. <laughs> <laughs> I used it as an axe. I go, go chopping blue. So I love that was my life. Um, you know, when I was at home, I I, I loved um, just messing around in the woods and in the bushes and playing outdoors and that sort of thing. So, so that was. So literally, we watched the Masters, and I literally said to Mum, "I want to try golf." We knew nothing about it. We went to Wellington City, my local club, and bowled in there and booked my six lessons. Chris Arnold was the assistant, and um, and I said, "I'm ready to know your first one lessons tomorrow." So the very cool, the very excellent thing that Chris Arnold did, which you cannot do with the kids today, he taught me discipline because mm. the first lesson was the grip. Mm. And the stance and the posture, so you know how boring. And then the kids today, give me, give me a ball. Let me rip it. <laughs> give me yeah. a three. Give me in three seconds. They've got to hit it. Mm. So, it taught, so then the next lesson was we start working on the swing, and da 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 back and through. And so I think I, well I know I did. I hit balls in the third lesson, mm. unheard of now, absolutely unheard of, isn't it? Mm. So he taught me this discipline thing of golf. And so I had my half a dozen lessons. So that is spring. Isn't that it's eight railroad or, tracks? Yeah, and so so here's the cool thing. My next door neighbor, Graham Thomas, he gave me a seven and an eight iron. Remember the ones we had the plastic coating on the shaft? You probably don't remember that. You kid. have no yeah. idea what you're talking <laughs> it a, about. But. It was a steel shaft, <laughs> and it had a plastic coating so, because it made it look like hickory, I guess. It's a big heads. You know, we probably had might even had dots on them. You know, it was grooves back in. I mean, these are old. We're going to have to look these up. I yeah, they were probably, we were probably, Bobby jo- they're probably Bobby Jones or something, you know. And so I I um, used to go across to the school playing field up the road, which wasn't my school. It was called Monk's Walk. And, oh, perfect. In the corner of the, of the, of the field, of the, you know, the track and field and everything, of course, there was a soccer line. So mm-hmm. Put the balls down on the line. And there was a long jump pit. At mm. the end there, you know, about probably, I don't know, 80 yards away, something I don't really, but, 
And I used to, I had 20 balls. I'd gone through the bushes and seriously found 20 balls. My mum was a dressmaker. She made me a little bag, put my balls in, and that was it. So off I went, put my balls. And, and I used to hit into the long jump pit. And I was good. And I'd get annoyed if I missed this long jump pit. Mm. And I'm sure I got sometimes, you know, sort of funny bit is 20 years later or whatever, when I'm a pro, I went back to have a look. Well, that long jump, it, it was skinnier than this table. I mean, a, a school long jump pit is only, what, six or eight feet wide and right, 12 yeah. foot long. And I'm getting, I can say pissed off on this, because I'm getting annoyed. You can say yeah, pissed can, off on this. Like, yeah. So I was getting pretty, like, typical me, like, I missed the split. I mean, I wanted to hit that long jump. Pit. I'm sure I got it 18 or out of 20 times. So again, see what, how I'm disciplining myself. Yeah. So then, okay, so fast track. So then that was school. And then mum and dad bought me, realized I was keen. They bought me a half set of clubs called St. Andrews, funny enough. And yep, I went out and I now joined. A half set, sorry. Half set. Meaning? Like, it did, did, you odds, did, just the odds. Three, five, seven, nine, I think. Just a half yeah. set. That was and my a, first set. A driver, yeah. a half driver set. and a three wood. That it, and I picked Otter. the putt. And I went in and they, they got me to pick the putter and I had got a Paddy Berg, lovely chunk of old brass, typical. Mm. Very similar, you know, skinny version of like the TPA 18 I ended up using, like a, it was just solid brass, lovely. So that's funny how I started. But anyway, so yeah, so I went down there. So I got these clubs on my birthday, 18th of July, and I went down to play my first round of golf and at 14 on my 14th birthday. And so I didn't know the rules. Um, and so I remember the funny bit, I three putted the third green. I still remember it. And I said, well, that's stupid. I'll never do that again. <laughs> How about that? Honest. <laughs> well, that's shit. You're never going to do that. And so I shot somewhere in the mid eighties. I know I lost three balls, so, but you know, so. In your first yeah. round. Yeah. So because I got, I've been hitting balls for three months, which is another wow. very good thing. You know, little did we know, you know, I've got past shanking, topping, missing it and that yeah. sort of thing. I could actually you know, half play, couldn't I? So that's how it all, and then I loved it. And then I used to go down the club and I might, and Lynn's, my wife, found a picture of me with the club. I used to put the clubs, I put a chunk of wood on my bike and tied it on somehow and I could put my club, because I didn't have a locker. Yeah, I wasn't really a member yet. And so, well, they made me a member. I didn't have a locker, I didn't have a handicap all that to get stuff. So typical, I like, you have to put in three cards back in the day, and I'm sure I did that. And I put cards in for like, I say, say 10 handicap, but they gave me a 24, because, you, know, you know, sort of. So, um, so that was my start. That was really it. Um, and I must have done that. So I'm still at school, obviously, so I'm only 14. So I then, I'm basically doing the same thing playing as much as I can, hitting balls in the evening, until I then made this, so I, it happened pretty quick. By 15, a year later, I, I said, right, that's it, I want to be a pro golfer. That was my decision, which is another pretty cool thing for a kid to have a real decision made. And then I, and the only way to do it, of course, in Britain was to leave school. Um, we don't have colleges, college system like America at all, you know. You, um, so it was like, so here's a, the funny bit was, so my dad said, well, go and find about being an assistant pro. So there was a job up the road at Nebworth, a golf club up the road. And back they were offering four pounds a week. Wow. Year, yeah, four pounds, yeah. This is, so what year was this? 73, isn't it? Yeah, 73. Four pounds a week. So my dad says to me, well, I get four pounds a week for you for child allowance. So we're going to lose. He said, well, I might as well keep you. I said, well, that's very nice of you, dad. Very nice of you. So I, that's how I stayed amateur. So I was able to go down and I lit, and I loved it. And I've never, my parents never had to, ch I never skived because I loved it. And I went down there every day, rain or shine, and tip my slowly. So my routine became... You know, I used to leave the house at eight. I'd get there by, and I'd cycle through the houses, through the woods, come out the other, had all the shortcuts to get to the golf club. And um, then I'd go on the practice ground. So I was down there by 
quarter past 20 past eight and I'd hit balls all morning till 12 o'clock. Wow. And I had a little corner hole in Wellington Garden City. That's all I had, just half a hole. It was a green right in the corner of the golf course. And it, there was an old pine tree down. I used to tip the balls down and the poor pine tree's even gone. <laughs> so I went to visit this a couple of months ago in the summer. My poor pine tree's even gone. So I used to tip out there and I used to hit balls to this green. So again, to cut a long story short, all I had was a green, a bunker, and a flag. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So unbeknown to me, every shot has intention. My first goal was to hit a ball over mm -hmm. that bunker and stop it before the flag. That mm -hmm. honestly was my first goal. Could I do that? Get it over and stop it. So you imagine I'm doing this thousands of times. Mm. And then, of course, my, my very good friend, Shellen Hager, is a sports psychologist. Well, he says, that, well, that's targeting. Yeah, exactly. It You're not still, just banging balls into a I'm not looking at range. 300, 200 yards. Yeah, I, exactly. I went to a range in Cambodia that we built. It's supposed to be 300 yards wide mm -hmm. this way, let alone that way. And, I, and there's targets. And I thought, you know, I only had one. So you think you're deprived. But you're not. It's mm. it was the best. That was the luckiest, best thing. Because mm -hmm. I hit every. So when I got bored with hitting seven irons and eight irons, and I did this, you know, I would. That's when I learned to hit two irons in slow motion. So I had to hit them that way while the golf was out there. So we didn't, then I realized if I sneak out in the morning early, really early, get there first and do my long stuff first, I'd hit them down the seventeenth hole mm -hmm. until I could then see on the hill. I could see the members come through the. The, the across the road and I used to run down and pick it and be like snow out there. I mean, I've had a big bucket of balls, my own balls, not range balls. And I run down, I pick them all up quick and, and then I, and then I couldn't hit them down the fairway. So that's how I used to hit my long shots. And so, and I used to, and the other interesting thing you always did as a kid, you hit them out there and then you'd always chip them to the bag or the pin, wouldn't you? <laughs> Which you don't do now. Right. And so you're you're hitting them out then. And then you're so practicing the one, yeah. Yeah, so every, and you're chipping them one-handed this, and they're in the bushes, and you go like this, or yeah. you'd be standing. The whole time you're just dialing you're your doing, timing. You're doing yeah. fun stuff. You're in the bunk, and you smack it, and one's, one's in grass like this, and, pff, and so you're doing that all the time. So again, little did you, so you're practicing this. You're looking mm. at a target and hitting it without thinking it. Mm. Very good for you. And so all those little things. So, and so then, I, I, as I said, I'd finish at 12 and I'd then go and have my sandwiches. I'd sit on top of the lockers and I didn't even have a locker, I don't think for a while, about six months. I'd sit on top of it and I had the same sandwiches. <laughs> so I used to make my own, so I used to do um, brown bread with, with have grated cheese and good old English salad cream, which is high in salad cream, or we have Branston pickle. So it was either pickle one day, or so, and then I, and then I used to. My mum used to give me a, or you should get a chunk of dates, you know, compressed dates. So you get a chunk of dates, take a slither of that, get one little chocolate bar, which of course was called a club, club. We had we had a club chocolate biscuit, we had a chocolate biscuit and a bit of fruit. It'd be like maybe an apple, and it was always in a round Tupperware. I had a round Tupperware which I put in my, so my sandwiches were always curved. <laughs> to get these sandwiches so and that was me and i did that legi every blimmin day and um so anyway so I had my lunch then i go and part on the putting room for half an hour to let my food go down sort of thing then i go and play and I, every and every day i played a minimum of 27 usually wow. on my own and um and that was 27 to 30 and i go home at dark and I'd bowl back home and I'd cycle back home with my clubs and stick them in the, we had a little outhouse, little shed, and I'd put my clubs in, I'd clean them, I'd love cleaning them all. You know, you get you clean your grooves out and wipe them down, everything. Mm, the love of the and, game. And come in and my mum would leave some food on the boiler thing and I'd sit and eat and, and that was rinse and repeat, you know, and in any weather. And then, um, and so, so now we're like so 16, next, well, I'm 17. Sixteen. So, so the next great thing, so I've only left, I've just left school. So dad took me, we went to Troon to the open and we had, a, we had a white VW Beetle and we loaded it up with our camping gear and we went up and camped uh, at, uh, at Troon. And I never forget, first thing I pulled into town 
at the gas station was Tony Jacklin in his Rolls Royce with Tom Weiskopf. Wow. Get out. They were filling out with gas. And I, I literally honest, I still see it. And they're in their Rupert Bear plaid, you know, and Tony would usually be in lilac and and um, Tom was a big yellow sweater, I think. And and I saw that and I'm when we went off to the camping site and we stayed in the camping site out of town um, somewhere and had a little had a little tent. I know I had a decent sized tent. We had a decent sized tent because we because it was we used to go to South of, we went to South of France, I think, once or twice. We had a decent sized tent. But I'm there with my dad and and you know, feed, I don't know, I can't remember where we ate. You know, probably did a bit of camping cooking and then who knows if we ate at a pub, I don't know. I can't remember that bit, but but I remember being so blimmin' cold going to Scotland that I I kept my pajamas on under my clothes when I went to the golf course. I, so I, didn't, I doubt if we watched all week because it was bloody freezing, you know. And um, so they were used to take me down to the course each day. And and he literally said, right, I'll see you here in front of the scoreboard. So I'll see you back here at five o'clock. It was a bit like that. And I went off and did my own thing. How amazing was that? Wow. Yeah. And so... Did it feel like your first time going to an event after all that work and practice? Well, I was, in, I mean, this is all early to start in the practice. You know, I've just left school, so then the Open was right then. So, you know, that was a huge inspiration. So I went and loved it. So I, you know, I found a way around to the back of the range, and I'd sit on the range, and, you know, and I, and I was, oh, I loved it because they're early in the week. I'm going to watch mm -hmm. Wise got practice on Tuesday, and he was practicing his street shoes, just in his street leathers. He was talking to Jack, grabbed it. He's clipping up there, and I'm watching this, you know, so I'm taking this all in. So I'm watching Jack and Arnold and Gary and Lee. And who else was big then? Did um, you know who they were? Like, did you recognize Yeah, yeah, them? oh, yeah, yeah. I knew, yeah, I knew. Saw I, I knew, yeah. We had a series on, yeah, you're right. We had a pro, what did we have? What was it called? It was a USA V the World. Must have been an IMG thing, a McCormack thing, because they, um, I mean, some of it was in black and white, I'm sure. <laughs> so, um, so we, I remember watching some of that, loved all that. So I knew all the, the names, all the, but I loved, so there's a couple of other guys with great swings. You know, Bruce Crampton was there with Nick DePaul, you know, catching it in the glove. And, you know, and you, and you could get so close to everybody. Um, that's what I loved. So, um, so that's 73, yeah. So... So really, that was really inspirational. And I ran like a lunatic. I followed Weisskopf and Miller, because they played together. We, I followed them. I was that little kid who, on every tee, would, I would dive in. I could come between the guy's legs. Literally, I could lay on the ground and watch them hit. And then I'd run like a lunatic. So I could literally watch every shot. I was everywhere around that golf course. And... Um, I can still remember some things because you can almost sneak onto the tee. Johnny Miller. Weisskopf hit a one iron on the on the seventh hole and the divot was like that. And I walked out on the tee and I thought, I never can't believe it. The divot was as thin as my finger, like that with a one iron, playing with Usti. And I'm like, you're kidding me. So I, you know, I was soaking all this up. Yeah. And of course you can tell, I went, then went back. So, the, so what that then did for me, which was so again, fantastic. Fortunately, I've got a very good, um, like photographic golfing memory, and I, so I would go back to Well and Garden and and mimic them, copy all their little idiosyncrasies. Mm. So you know, I've got Jack in the chin, and I've Gary kicking the knee in, and I said, you know, Trevino still talking, and Arnold, you know, we get that going to hit, and Arnold Palmer, do the finishes and that sort of thing. So again, I used to go out and I would play, as I said, on my own, but I'd play a three ball against Jack and Arnold. So it'd be Jack and Arnold, Jack fades it, Arnold draws it. Yeah, Gary draws it, Trevino fades it, or Miller fades it, Weisskopf drew, drew it, you see. So I would pick my guys and, and I would play. So, so cool. again, what is it doing for me? When I'm hitting a three wood, I'm pretending to be Jack. Of course it's going to be good, isn't it? It's Jack, get me? Mm. So I'm thinking Jack can do this. Jack's going to hold it through. Well, sure, it might have gone like this, but... I went very instant confidence. Very important. Yeah. You've got to go in with the right intention. So the yeah. intentions were coming. I'm Jack. I know what I'm doing. And for me, oh, I'm going. Oh, I'm going to hold on this and that. 
and so you can see, and again, it's keeping it fresh. And, and I'm, I'm blessed, blessed to, I've been out there 50 freaking plus years. I've never, I can use the word never been bored about going out and hitting golf balls. Mm. Never. Wow. How about that? Never. I can use, the, even now I go, oh, that'd be nice. Go down, hit some balls. And I do. So I've never said, oh, pff, can't be bothered. Never. So how cool is that? So to pick a sport that keeps you so engrossed. So that's what I did. So I did that all through the summer. Well, now I'm doing it. Now I've left school. So I'm doing that all the time. So that was my daily routine. Go down and do that. Crash bang, wallop. And then where do we get to? And then, so that's 73. 70, by the end of 74, you know, I made the England boys team. We played up a Hoy Lake. Uh, played, and then the 75, I get, I'm going to get really good. I start winning. I win. I won the. Um, so you went. So you played in junior tour. So you entered junior tournaments, and then you got on the boys' team. And that's yeah, I, yeah, little... yeah. I played. I played. I played little club things. I won. My first one was a course called John of Gaunt. I've still got. Probably got. A, I'm putting have a picture of me on the wall. They went no, but my name's on the board. It's, it's my first win, and I won the odd club stuff and that local stuff and that sort of thing and then 75 was my big year so by then i'm, I'm I probably won the probably won the county boys first in the year and then we had a big tournament called the berkshire trophy you know at royal berkshire and i won that and i won it playing with the big ball because at the time we were in the transition now 75 we we're just transitioning like amateur golf you could still use it you had a choice before they changed you know, we were right on that transition. So I, I won with the with the big ball and everybody was very impressed with that. Um and then I with the, am I missing something here? The big what? Big ball. Well we but we called it when we had the Britain, it was the small ball. We were one point six eight two. And Got then it. you're one point six no, you're one point six eight, and we're one point. We were one point six two. You knew about this? Different size of the ball. Yeah, come yeah, on. We had the small. Uh, man, come well, on, I'm the amateur on the ball. Yeah. I mean, you got golf coach. No, it was. It was the. It was the. When you came over for the open, it the American players would swap. They said, "Well, you might as well use it because it went further. Obviously, a smaller ball, same mm. weight, smaller ball, went further. So you did. They you changed, but but we knew that it was fine. I think seventy four at the open. It will. It went to the big ball, but amateur golf after was, I guess, had a little transition period before it became official. Can't remember when, but I. So that was that was kind of a big thing, and then, and then in the summer I won the. Uh, the English amateur up at Royal Lytham. So no, so then my next story. Oh no, yeah, my next story is. Um, so I played in the British amateur Hoylake. But you know, we just had the open. Mm. And it's still to this day the worst weather I've ever played in. Mm. Day one at the at the, at the you know, in amateur days, you know what it's like. They kept you out there. Oh yeah, <laughs> as long as they didn't lose you. We only got the they course kept... for today. Yeah, right. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so we were out there. It must have been blind sixty and pouring with rain. And you were, you know, you had crappy waterproofs, and you're in there. And honest to God, as I see, if you broke ninety, you won your match. Honest as I sit here, it was ridiculous. How how old were we at that for that first one? So it's just seventy five. So we're, um, years old. Um, I'm only eighteen. Seventeen. Yeah, I'm eighteen. Yeah. I'm eighteen years old. Just coming up to eighteen, I think. Yeah. No, this is in May. I think this is May of seventy five. So I'm seven. So I'm still seventeen. So I played in that, and I beat a guy called Badger Davis, Sunningdale member. Maha. And of course, he's got. <laughs> Willie Aitchison, who's Lee Trevino's caddy on the bag. And so Willie was impressed. And he said, you trying to qualify for the Open? And I said, yeah, which is a Carnoustie. And he says, if you qualify, you can play with Lee Trevino on Monday morning. I said, you're joking. <laughs> I said, how come? He Because he says, I'm the boss. Leah like that. So, so I, um, I missed. I went to Monty Feith and I missed the blimmin' qualifying by two. And... And I was sick as a parrot. And I, and I was waiting there. So I went down there Monday morning. He said, hey, don't worry, you can walk. And I walked next to Lee Trevino's bag, literally chatting to him for three days. Wow. How about that? And it was another greatest experience. What a, what a, what a wonderful man. I mean, he, and, I, and I know a couple of crazy things. It took him two and a half rounds before he missed a green. So I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah honest. And, and he says to me, do you want the, I'll show you the non-choking putting stroke. And I'm like, yeah, sure, sure. So he 
we, or I'm on the punting room, literally. And he gave me a big forward press, boom. He said, you've got to forward press it, lock it, bang. Forward press it, lock. So, and then, and the other great thing from that, I remember 16, 16 at Carnoussi, big par three. Wind is probably off the right. You know what Lee was right. Kick it up, put the driver off the deck, you know, hit it to two feet, right? <laughs> Next day, driver off the deck. They've moved the flag, driver, two feet from the hole. Twice, twice in a row. And I'm like, okay, so you're getting, one, he you're getting <laughs> one hell of a lesson, aren't you? But anyway, so, and, and the other thing I remember, um, I sat behind Watson, who, you know, eventually winning, on the back of the range, you could just sit, lay on the ground, and he tipped his bag of balls out right there, and he was hitting one irons right in front of me. And he got it, and Gene Littler had like 20 bloody McGregor drivers, and you're like, so you know, my equipment was, crap back then for a long time was crap and you've got these guys with you know right dangling um and uh oh there was another another funny story as well it was uh it was quite historic because when i was at hoylake for that british amateur america just won the walker cup at st andrews and then, you know 50 years later they went back to st andrews so right pretty rare. and because guys on the team then were you know jerry pate Jay Haz, George Burns, Craig Stadler, probably Curtis Strange. So I'm one heck of a Walker Cup yeah. team. And I know, and I, I'm good friends with Jerry. And so I was telling him, I was on the, I was that kid again on the back of the range when you tipped your balls out. And he just went, a bag of brand new Titleists. Mm. I said, where do you get those from? And the guy said, what did they give them to me? And, I, and I'm, I said, I'm, I'm the kid going in the bushes to get my eyes. <laughs> My balls have got chunks hanging off them, you know, and he just tips up. You imagine the guy tipping a bag of Tylers right out in front of me. I'm like, so, so that was my amateur days. You know, that was, um, that's how I got started. But, and I said, so I guess the key things were one was, as, as we talked about, the intention on the range, self taught intention. And, and all this didn't show. I think it's one before that, if I, if I may. I think the first lesson I just took from that is that when you put a club in your hands, it was discipline. The yeah, okay, so we got discipline. the discipline first. You agree. You weren't just discipline. banging balls. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I suddenly, even though I'm 13, or so, you know, four, yeah, 13 then, I'm thinking about it. You're right. The discipline, then it was in intention, intention and then the visualization. 100%. You know, that, so those three things uh, have given me a career. That yeah, was, and just to just really to recap what the visualization is, because I think this is such an important piece, is that you were pretending to be pretending. three of the greatest golfers all of all the, time all the by time. yourself on a course, and you're imagining all okay, day long. This is Jack. Jack sets it yeah. up like this. I'm gonna hit that exact shot that he's hitting. And every time you're in yeah. the button, and then you read Gary play, you see bunker shots for a, a morning. So I go and hit bunker shots for a morning. I moved all the sand onto the green. And that's more than yeah. just like what we, you know, yeah. Eric, Eric coaches me. And so Eric talks about all the time. Like you have to practice, like you're hitting the shot you want to hit. That's one thing to hit the shot you want to hit and to see it. Yeah. But to go one layer deeper than that is to actually imagine the person. You so are, you're like embodying yeah, you're right. oh, yeah. the greatness of that person. And even after the lessons, when you were hitting to the, where the long jump was there too, that was one target you were hitting. To one yeah, target, target, right. One even target. before that. The target. Yeah. So oh, the target, one target. Gosh. That is a really good. The way, so I teach, you know, with my, with my series, with my kids, I say, please look at the target and pay attention to the target. You know, don't just hit a seven iron out there and see it go and then rate the neck. Right. Because guess what? When it's landed out there, it's actually missed by 12 yards. Well, that's missed green. Yeah. You've missed the green. A lot of people don't even watch till the ball hits the ground. No, they don't even no. enjoy no, it. You know, the biggest thing in this <laughs> is yeah. what, you're sa what you're saying is actually like a huge problem in golf is that we are so focused on hitting the ball yeah. that we're forgetting that like there's this whole other piece of the game, which is arguably like... Well, it's more important. Way more the, important. The mm -hmm. flight and where it's going to finish. Yeah. Because again, when you get to psychology, you have to visualize the finish of mm. a project. So if you're going to build a house, you've got to see the bloody roof and everything. You mm -hmm. can't just visualize a pile of bricks. Mm -hmm. you agree? Mm -hmm. If you're going to run a race, you have to go the the tape. If you're going to ride a bike, are yeah. you thinking about pushing the pedals, holding the... No, you're no, looking you're gonna, ahead and well, you're Well, exactly. Going if you're going to go to the shops, you have to visualize. Get on your bike or a car. That's and it. it will go into a restaurant. You have to visualize the goal. The goal is I'm going to pull into the parking lot. Oh, I'm going to have a juicy steak. That's what you, but you don't, and then you, this is part of the journey to get to the goal. And so that's, 
And that is really important. And that's what I was, I was all literally self-taught. Yeah, you were lucky to have that land. I mean, that you you yeah. got those lessons super early. That was a and I'm I'm curious as we go from there, from the amateur into the pro professional. But before, when you said you'd have that, go practice hit balls in the morning, have your lunch, do the putting, go play. Were there any other kids around that you would play against? It was always yeah, no, not a lot, not a lot. I had a couple of guys, but you know they were either at, still at school. I played with them at weekends. You know, it, <laughs> so weekends were tough at the club. Amazing. I played in. You know, this is classic British. I played in one monthly medal. So I'm, I'm, I'm standing around at the club and a couple of members were obviously nice to me. One of the members came and says, oh, do you want to play in the, with me in the monthly medal? I said, oh, I'd love to. He said, oh, there's nobody on the 10th tee. So it's 10.45, so we scoot across and we go across and get on. And because I shoot 72 with my five handicap, 67, so I'm going to lead, I'm, lead, I'm winning the monthly medal. And I'm sitting at the bar and the captain comes over and he says, you have, we have to disqualify you because juniors are not allowed on the course to 11 o'clock. Oh. How many wow. more monthly medals do you think I played in? Wow. That was it. That was Zero. It. I never played another monthly medal. Wow. I mean, that was the British, until we finally got a great captain by the name of Clive Harkett. Wow. Who then realized, if I help the junior golfers, this, you know, if we, Right. It's the and circle of golf. And if I look after the junior golfers, they're the future members and blah, blah. And we went off and we went. And sure enough, we then won the county championship. We were the best club in. So then they were proud of us. Yeah. You go from the other guys, I won't even mention their names, because they were, they were just resented juniors. You know, it was like, well, they probably, whatever. Yeah. Whatever reasons, they resented it. And so I thought that was, you know, so I never used to hang around at the club. I used to do all my practice, you know, at the weekends, I might sneak out in the mornings and, and then disappear. So, but a couple of members I used to play golf with, which was pretty cool. And there's a couple of junior guys. John Morehouse was one of them. He actually ended up caddying for me. Another guy by the name of Trevor, Trevor Powell. So we used to play a bit, just a little little group of us. Um, but but I did 99% of the practice on my own. Interesting. You know? Which, again, we're very fortunate with golf. You can be completely engrossed yep. in playing all day all on your own can't you because oh, yeah, there's so much to do it's you versus I mean, you yeah yeah you versus so, you and, and, I, golf and, course. and you know and to think how as i said i was completely happy when bombed down it and then uh, so then the, so when it was really bad when the weather was brutal you know like it'd been raining sleeting then i had a mate called ron marks and i used to go carpet fitting yeah carpet fitting, carpet fitting fit carpets and he had a little he had a one-man business and he paid me two pounds a day. And I used to go off and fit carpets all day long. And we, and we used to have the biggest laugh that it was like a comedy show. We, we genuinely had the, you know, you imagine going into little old dears houses and, and we're gonna fit the carpet and, the, and <laughs> we would have such a laugh. It was crazy. I did, we had one a true story. We had one kid who was annoying me so much little brat i taped him to the banister of the stairs <laughs> I said, I got, I got, I said, but he wouldn't go away or whatever i'm trying to work and that's why i taped him <laughs> so, and we did have the and we back saw, in the we, good old days when you could just tape the kids that, to the yeah. banisters <laughs> <laughs> such a laugh you know like there'll be a lump in the carpet and so it's going oh, and you just knock it down with the hammer and then the lady would say have you seen my parrot you know, <laughs> we go, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> now, would you hit balls during the winter at all? Or would you take a couple yeah. months off? Yeah, no, hit. I tried. To, I, as I said, I tried to go out there in everything. Uh, my mum made me a set of waterproof, a waterproof jacket. That's all I had because she was a dressmaker. And I used to go, and I used to go down and just survive. I guess until my hands were frozen. Now, we didn't get a lot of snow in Britain. We get a lot of kind of wet sleet and it would disappear. You get a few days, it would be frozen. You know, you couldn't do anything on the frozen days, but there wasn't many. Mm. I mean, really, I'm out there all the time. So, you know, there was none of... Oh, and then the other thing, which was very cool, that mum and dad did, they... So, as I said, I used to put my clubs in the with a little shed out back. I put my clubs in, and I go out and clean them. Everything. So, mum and dad put a light outside for me on the on the shed wall, and because it got the reflection in the window. 
And so I could now stand outside and, and look at my blooming back swing oh, a thousand cool. times. You know, in the direction. And so something I did which was detrimental to my, which were created me and my slow rib, we had a pickaxe. Mm. You know, good old pickaxe with the, mm -hmm. which are really heavy. Super heavy. Thick. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I used to swing this bloody pickaxe. Mm. So that's why I learned to swing slow. Because yeah. I am swinging a slow, because we always thought, you know, big and we didn't know, we didn't understand that speed stick now, you know, right. go faster. It was like, this will make me stronger. And, he, and my coach, Ian Connolly, taught me, he said, you know, tempo, we call it, we, what do we call tempo. it back then? Tempo or rhythm. And, uh, um, you know, between the two, to slow, they have the ability to literally hit shots in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I used to do that. I, I could stand out there and hit any club super slow, you know. And it was so funny. But years later, we went on tours. Where were we? We were at Bingley St. Ives. And the range was about 180 yards long. And because the tour said you could only hit irons. So I peg up my driver. <laughs> and they, and they, and it was. Yeah, I'm um, just going to chip him out there. Yeah, okay. and, uh, <laughs> and, oh, God, I can't think of the rules guy. Um, Damn it, can't. and I could have stood up to watch this and went and hit this little 150 yard little <laughs> whoop, blooper. But yeah, I could do that. I could stand up, a lovely smooth, full swing. Mm. Isn't that a and, lesson um, right there? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we're going to get to it moving yeah, forward. So but that, one of the things when you watch a lot of the tournaments, I think that probably played a big role in your ability to hit pin high so often, mm. your distance control with the irons. Like, think about how good you had to be with what you just Well, that's quality of strike. Yeah. You know, because you 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 know it, it that's technique and stripe. Because if you you know how to crunch it and you know exactly how far it's going to go, and you're able to do it, you're really, you're able to strike it the same all the time. And I think yeah. under pressure, you know, if you as you know, if you you hit an eighth of an inch in our game, you're losing you're just, whatever two or three two or three yards. But the idea was to stand up and crunch it because you've done it so many times. And I think that's um, gives you the ability to dial it back as well. Yeah, but you have to be able to hit well, it. Oh yeah, yeah, I did. You know, we're a long way off before I start learning different shots. Um, Crumbs. I'm trying to think. So, as you said, so where are we in my life? Let's say we're finishing up the amateur. When when do you turn pro? Well, uh, God, how did that all happen? So I'll tell that story. So I've had a great year in '75. I've won. You know, I'm the best in the Sandy Lyle and I. The two best. We back in the old handicap system, we were the only two golfers at plus one mm. um, in the country. And so the in thing was of course wow. the in thing of course was to come to America and university. So I got a couple of offers and I ended up going to Houston. And cut a long story short, I hated it. Um because I've now got to go to class and so I've lost my practice time. Yeah. And we didn't have a practice ground there. And we had to be driven out to a golf course. And we used to come straight out of the car park, straight to the first tee and go and play. And there was no practicing. And um, Coach Williams, Dave Williams. And so after about 10 weeks or so, I said, well, it must have been the ninth week, I said, I don't want to play and I need to go and practice. So he went, we had a, we used to have a team meeting. I guess that was Monday. And he says, um, let me tell you, boys, the players today are great players, not practices. Mm. And I'm like, Hogan, Trevino, Jack, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Gary. I said, yeah. <laughs> so sure enough, I get my way. I go and practice for three days on my own. And I played in a little inter intercollegiate thing and I won it. Wherever the hell that was, I don't know. And, so um, and we're back in the team on Monday and he says, boys, if you want to be a great player, you've got to practice. <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I went, literally went into his office. I said, uh, can you book me a flight home? He says, you're homesick. I said, no, I just want to go home. He said, you miss your girlfriend? I said, no, I just want to go home. <laughs> so I was done. So I went, came back and kind of got a lot of, finally got bad publicity saying I'm weak, throwing it, the towel in on that. And I won, I went up in Scotland. I played it. Craig Miller Park, and I won that one. And it was like nobody was interested. Mm. Yeah, it was like, and then my, actually, it was my girlfriend's father at the time said, um, You thought of turning pro? So I, um, 
said, yeah, that's a good idea. And back then you had to apply to the, it was a good old British PGA. Way back then it was just the British, that's, that was our tour, it was the British PGA controlled our tour, which was basically about 16 or 18 tournaments in Britain and, and only the national opens around Europe. You know, the Swiss, Spanish, French, just like one in each country. It's all done a complete flip now. And so I, I was sitting, I had some friends at um, Titleist, was just up the road from me. I was up there and they were trying to make me a set of clubs or something. And they said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna turn pro. I said, well, do you think you should tell anybody? So I called, Mike, I called Michael Banalek, who was, ended up being our secretary of the RNA, because I was meant to be playing in the, I think the Hampshire Hog the tournament. And then, um, and that date was April the 14th, 1976, which is pretty cool, because April the 14th, 1996, you know what happened. Hello. And so 20 years to the day, I thought, which wow. I think is very cool. And so I literally, um, and Titleist gave me a ring gauge for ball ring gauge. Because back in the day, golf balls weren't round, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> and you used to push a, put a golf ball on it and you'd spin the golf ball and the golf ball would suddenly lock. And it, so golf balls were not round, completely round. Wow. So Titleist gave me a ring that. gauge, yeah? Which is exactly, it was 1.682. It was two thousandths of an inch bigger than 1.68. And we had to check our golf balls, the size of our golf wow. balls. Yeah, there you go, you youngsters. Never heard of None that. None of this polyurethane stuff now. Um, so we had, and I've still got that ring gauge. I'm very proud. That ring gauge went, it's been to every golf tournament I've ever So this is to. like on the first tee. I'm, so I'm, I'm playing a, a, a red two, like Tyler's red two. Oh, we checked and it before. You guys are checking the Oh, we size. checked yeah, it. Yeah. You check them before, and then you check, and then you have them in the them back, and you check them when you're out there. So you've whacked it. Yeah, you you'd get sit, it. It would sit on the ring cage. You said, now it was out of shape. So we used to change a ball. Really, oh, times I mean, you changed. could almost back in the day. There's a lot I don't know, obviously, but yeah, yeah. that right there, allegiance. I would argue that like most when of the we went, when we know. went to Square Grooves and things like that, you they were, we called them the one hit wonder. You hit you hit them once with anything less than a six iron, and the ball was done. Wow! You should go through guys. You went through a dozen or balls. Wild. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't realize. You don't realize some of them. So yeah, How fortunate I, we are. Yeah, you yeah the, the equipment now. We, yeah, as we crazy. know, is off the charts. So. And that was it. So I, I then, um, so where are we? So you made the decision like, to go pro. Yes, that you made went a decision. And I had to wait. They said, you're going to tell anybody. No. And so I had to, so I played my first tournament. It was the French Open in June. I went off to Le Touquet and I had to qualify. I had to do the Monday qualifying. Yeah. Um, so I got on tour because I was a full, inter full England international. So I didn't, I don't know if we had a qualifying school way back then. I doubt it. And then, and so the, um, to cut a long story short, the big, the gold year one was our order of merit was the top 60. And if you finish in the top 60, then you're exempt for the next year. So that was my first goal. And I finished 58. Wow. And with a rookie sum, kids, I think I won about 2,300 pounds. Mm. But even worse, I wasn't allowed to accept prize money for the first six months because I was, whatever like coming from amateur right. pro and they thought if you hadn't accept i think they thought if you hadn't accepted prize money and you wanted to change your mind you weren't then deemed as a professional mm. but i was allowed them the prize money in the in the open in the opens i.e the national opens french open german that's so i remember winning i won 500 pounds in the german open i finish. i think i finished fifth something like that so that was big wow and and I finished 58th. I won about 2,300, and that was. And I'm now exempt for 77. Here's the funny bit. So 77 is now. I went well. 77's Ryder Cup year. I want to make the Ryder Cup. And that's the very long way of telling you. Yeah, from six years on, from four, first round at 14 to playing in the Ryder Cup at 20 against Jack, the man who inspired me. Uh, six years later, I played in the Ryder Cup. That How about that? Unbelievable. I should pause for thought. It, it, take a drink of water on when, that one. When, when you first went from the amateur into the pros and you're playing on the European tour there, 
Did you notice a difference in, did you like adapt to that right away? Or no, that was tough. Cause I, you know, we were, we were again, not like now when, you know, because of the, the great coaching and all the facilities and everything, you, you, you heard the terminology, you, 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 you went on tour and you were an amateur learning to become a professional. I mean, your swing wasn't good enough. You were being educated like you cannot believe. Talk wow. about a smack over the back of the head. I mean, it was, you know, learning to travel, playing on the, you know, playing for a month in a row. Because, you know, amateur golf was really like, almost like every two weeks sort of thing. You played a big tournament. Suddenly you're playing every week, you know, you're going to jump on a plane, go off to different places, or you're driving up and down in your car, up and down the country. That's really what you were doing in Britain. Gosh, um, yeah, as I said, I, you remember your first tournament, you know, a French Open. I can't, you know, I'm not sure what my second tournament was I played in. It's funny that you can't um, always remember the first ones, don't you? So you didn't win the second one, right? No, no, no. So you forget, Jeepers. you forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did we just oh, talk oh, about we, a few minutes ago? We just forget those ones. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I was all part of the charging around Europe, just getting experience. That was really it. And then I, where are we, 77? We played in a team event up at... Um, Glen Eagles, Skull Lager thing. And I, there was a 36 hole tournament before it. And I won that in a playoff. So I won, yes, yeah, so my first tournament I win is a 36 hole tournament. And then. Is this in your first year? Yeah, my first, no, my, well, yeah, 77 is my first full year. So they called that my first rookie year. So, you know, I was in, and I won that. And I, well, but here's a good one. I think I won about somewhere about 8,000 pounds or 9,000 pounds in my season. And I made the Reddick Cup team. Oh, wow. <laughs> and how did you find out about that? Did you, was that like a call, someone? How did you? No, no, no. I, I made it full. I was, I think I finished eighth. I, I qualified. I qualified for the, for the team. And, um, gosh, which was Lytham St. Anne's. And uh, that was the one where they, they only had just one foursomes, one four ball, and then the singles because you know America was so strong they were going to just it'd be over and done with before we even got mm. to the singles. So they only had one, and then and um, so here's the, here's the next. So the week before, I'm playing in a tournament and I'm I go out in 32 and back in 42 and I'm feeling crap. Can't work it out. And I go to the Ryder Cup and you've got all your dinners and you've got your gear and everything. And we got cashmere sweaters. I'll never forget. I still got it. And it was too short. It only came to about there. Looked like my pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. And I got, and I looked down and I've got a big rash on my, and all these pressure points. So I said, I need a doctor. I don't feel good. So I went to the doc and he took blood. And I fainted, bonk. I looked at it, saw the first time I've seen blood come out my arm, bonk. And he says, you've got glandular fever, right? And I go, God, I my mum and dad came to the, the right account. I went back and said, oh, I've got glandular fever. She says, we know. I said, what do you mean you know? He says, well, we knew you were looking sick and everything, but we didn't want to tell you. Typical Faldo, very good person <laughs> stuff. And then so I'm, I guess because luckily I've got, I'm engrossed in, good, good, good point. If you're engrossed in doing something, you can overcome it. And then, um, and obviously I then had this fantastic opening Ryder Cup. You know, I played with Usti. Yeah. And, um, you know, for day one, we're playing, um, we play Ray Floyd and Lou Graham. And Lou Graham, I think he was the US Open champion. And Usti, so we played awesome day one and and Usti said well you're a better iron player than me he decided that morning I think and said you can have the first tee shot which is par three you know so <laughs> a few extra six irons and then and off we went and Usti kept hitting it in the right rough and what happened we were three down after nine and boom and then we win we win two and one how about that first and, uh, yeah first right <laughs> cover and Usti says to me did you think we were going to lose? I said, no, I didn't. He says, nor did I. How about it? So anyway, next day, I'm playing Jack. Jack and Ray Floyd. Jeez. So here you are. There's my year. Six years later, I'm playing Jack. 
And so, what did you find? What did you feel like when you found that out? Oh, it's <laughs> frighteningville, isn't it? Yeah. So they had big, beautiful because they got big red cardigans on and bag this bloody big, and we're you know, and there we are in our little brown coat, you know, brown sweater and this sort of thing, and. I couldn't look at Jack, obviously, you know, and he's looking at it. And, and I had, I was long. I had a, the first Aldilla. Remember Aldilla brought you in? Aldilla mentioned the graphite shaft. Okay, it, thanks. It, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and this, this is also this, a history lesson this, for this us. This millennials. shaft was like licorice stick. You could twist it. It had five degrees of torque on this thing. So talk about timing. You had to wait for this thing to go yeah. wobble its way down and through. But if you timed it, off it went. It was it was way longer. It was the it was the big invention then, and I was quite long. I think I had it on a Tony Penner head, and I popped this thing out. And I never forget on the fourth hole. It's so funny. I just saw the highlights again from a million years ago. We're gonna have and, to and I'm sitting, and I can never forget. I'm standing there, and I know Jack's twenty yards behind me, and I can feel his eyes in the back of my neck. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's looking at me. He's looking at me, and he was. He was thinking, who the hell's this kid? You know. And then actually, then I hit my second shot. I saw it on, thanks to good old TikTok, I hit my second shot on the fourth at like this. I must have won the hole, I guess. <laughs> and so we beat Jack, technically three and one. Beat Jack Nicholas, beat Jack. first How time, about first about Ryder Cup, first time that? played him. And then, what and then, story. so that was, and then the next day I played Watson, open champion, and I beat, <laughs> and I beat him one up. So that was my right. Uh, Jack Ryder Cup. Watson back to back <laughs> six it? years after he picked six up his first ago. golf club. Let me just let me just recap. <laughs> I got to I got to go back for the lessons here because I'm like downloading lessons. Yeah. Another lesson. So we got the golf lessons, but there's a life lesson here. Have you noticed that when he starts to tell a story, he starts the story by picking out the thing he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then he never gets off of that until that's what happens. Mm -hmm. He says, I saw Jack on TV and I'm going to. I'm going to learn to hit it like that. Does it like that? He says, I'm going to go, I'm going to go play in this, in this, uh, in this event. And then he goes and wins this event. Then he says, I'm going to go get into the Ryder cup team. And then he go gets, goes and gets yeah, in the Ryder cup team. True. Picks up, picks what he wants he pick a goal. and he has, picks hey, a goal and he's right. got laser like right. focus to get there. It works ferociously. Yeah. And works like yeah, an yeah. absolute yeah. Yeah. horse. No, I agree with that. I mean, when you learn it's a fast track later, you learn that I did the, um, I did the um, sports psychology. I turned into sports psychology with, um, is that name Shark, Shark T, T, Tikaway? How does it pronounce? Oh, Tikaway, Shark T, Tikaway. It's, oh, I can't even think what it's called. Oh, it's that visualization. So when you do the pink bubble technique and this sort of thing, and I used to sit there and visualize. So what do you want at the end of the week? Well, I would like to win a big trophy. That's the trophy at the end of the week. And you've got to visualize it and feel, sit there quietly and feel it, see it, feel it, put it in the pink bubble, send it out to the universe to manifest. Mm. Boom. And I was doing that all the time. I used to, oh, yeah, you're going. I used to sit and, well, no, later, late when I mm. then learn. Creative, creative visualization. Creative visualization. That's what I just pulled creative, up. Yeah. What, how do you pronounce it? Shakti. 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 Yeah, it's it's like from What's the same, surname, from the Shakti. yoga. Where you, this is, so you do, whatever. You tapped into it. So I used to do. I used to be doing that twice a day. Honestly, I used to do it in the morning, evening, sit and visualize what I wanted for the day, and then you can, and it's a very cool because you can then visualize things that go wrong, mm. and how you're going to deal with it. Yeah, that was it. I've had that. How do you pronounce it? Gawain? Gawain. Gawain. Shakti Gawain. I mean that's a Gawain. I mean that's a that is one of the biggest selling. Yeah. See this. Um, but I used to sit and do that and I thought that was, I like keeping things really simple. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a simple guy yeah. about simple things. And I, you know, just a few words that are, that are powerful, which you then learn later in life, you know, um, you know, choice, the word of choice is very powerful in that Lou Holtz talked about everything is a choice and you suddenly mm -hmm. realize, my God, it really is. Um, and how you react to everything. So, but that was powerful to sit there and visualize what I wanted for the week and how I was going to do it and that sort of thing. And so you've got a clear, you've got a clear intention. Well, that's my goal. And this, this is a journey. And golf's really simple because it's first tee is your start of your journey. 
Mm. Isn't that? Shot by shot by shot mm. by hole by hole by hole, you know, and that's how you get there. And I hate it when people say, oh, he wanted it too much. He's thinking about it too much. Well, you've got to think about the result. Mm. I want, you know, that's how I do, you know, and, and people get wound up of how they get that journey. But I think it's, that's what I was able to do. I, I just want to hit one more Ryder Cup and then we can move, move beyond that too. Yeah. So you, you, you're in the Ryder Cup day two against Jack. Was that the first time you guys met in person? Probably, yeah. No, no, it's not. No, no, no. It's That's the funny bit. So, oh my God, this will take another hour. This story. We got this is, uh, here. I know we've got another episode coming up. We're going to get a lot of Jack talk in there. So. Well, this is the big, this is the big Jack story. So let me try and tell you this quickly. So <laughs> Jack is, was in, the introduction, the inspiration. Of course, we've all got his book and everything, aren't we? You know. So the great story about Jack is he has this ability to forget losses, delete them. Very important thing in golf. Oh, I love it? this story. If you can learn to even delete the last shot, you are golden. And there's blooming mm -hmm. going on, yeah. as we know. So I've heard about it. So the story was Jack was at Ohio State University, and he's doing a talk, and he blurts out, I have never three-putted in the back nine of a major. <laughs> And he said, this guy in the back, Mr. Nicholas, uh, 1964 PGA, 14th <laughs> green. And then Jack goes, I have never three putted in the back nine of a major. And Mr. Nicholas, I've got it on video A if you'd like to see it, you know. So he goes, no, I have never three putted. I may have missed, but I never caused it to mm, miss. And you go, wow. There's yes, a distinction a right there. Yeah, this is it. So, mm -hmm. so, so you learn that Jack's deleted. Right. Got this ability to delete. So fast forward. So there we are sitting in, and I said, Jack, you don't remember where we first we first met, do we? I look at him, I says, and he goes, No. So I said, um, <laughs> Troon. So I, the famous open, when I've gone my very first open, they got the, the Royal Hotel is here, and the range is there, and I'm going to the Porter Johns, as you call it here, they're the good old toilets in Britain. Sure. Uh, and <laughs> And Jack jumps over the fence right in front of me to avoid the, the crowds to get to the toilet and then go to the range, right? And right in front of me, there's Jack. Boom, comes over the fence, golden hair and everything, and he goes in, and they're big, long, green boxes, these toilets, you know, with the urinals all the way around. And, he go, and I just stand at the door frozen, and I just stop. And he's in there on his own, right? And he goes in, and he comes out. I didn't shake hands. That's my funny. <laughs> and so, and I just like, and I don't know if I asked him for an autograph. I may I don't think so. We didn't even have autographs in those days. I was too poor for autographs. And so, I then said. So I then went in there, and I'm telling Jack this story. I said I went in there, and I looked at this big urinals, which is about 20 feet of this, and I whittled. All the way around. I said, well, I can't play like Jack Nicholas, but I can whittle where he does. You see? <laughs> so Jack is listening and he goes, what is whittled? You know, so everybody's laughing. Their ass. He's taking a leak. So, so, yeah, taking a leak. So I said, that is when we first, so I'm, this is, you know, this is the big intro. So I said, well, of course, Jack, you, you remember when we played the Ryder Cup? And he goes, no. Don't I said, no, 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 stop messing about. I said, I know you've got this strength to delete things. I said, we played the second day of the Ryder Cup and I beat you. Too. No, I don't remember. Mm. I said, no, you're kidding. Yeah. Jack, it's me. It's Nick. I know, I know, I know the freaking story. <laughs> you, you delete everything. He says, no, I don't remember. I went, you bastard. <laughs> he said, I, this is great. I said, the man who's inspired me. I'm now calling him a bastard. I said, so I thought that was classic. And, then, and we have that joke to now, still today. Here we are. I saw him at the end of last year, and I tell the same same story. He said, I, and I've got the and I, and I, I watched it. it last night. Did you that? And I, I watched I've got the interview it. last I, night. I found it on my phone. I said, just His there you go. Face is, I mean, it's as blank as it. Uh, no, I don't he's remember. Not your no, balls. We're, we're the same. Yeah. I, I agree with hundred percent because you know, I, look, I played. I don't know. I played hundred majors, and I've got knows how many tournaments, four or five. And you have to delete. You delete. Obviously, you only, anything you attach, as we know, an emotional memory to, well, then you, yeah. you, you, you carry You remember it. You, you, you remember you. that. Like, obviously, the Ryder, the Ryder Cups, 
um, or the audio or my op my major wins there is emotion in there when once you put emotion to a picture or an experience then it creates a memory so i can sure i can remember all the all my majors but or, or, or wins at the right time you've jogged my memory i go but you tell me where i finished in the spanish open in so and so year and daddy i haven't got a clue mm. I haven't got a clue you know and and you kind of and i think i do that in life as well i have a very simple motto in life that you know if i can I say to myself, if I can fix something, fix it. Mm. If I can't, forget it. You mm. have to delete. Mm. You really do. It's, a, it's a quite a good you lesson. Fix it, it, fix it if you can't forget it. You've okay. got to delete it because there's so much stuff that mm. happens in your life. And it's, and it's bad shit. Mm. You know, this is bad stuff that you can't. If you can't fix the bad shit, yeah. then you have to delete it. Yeah. Some things have cost me millions or whatever or whatever, money or relationships or whatever you've done, whatever mm. things have happened in your life bad experiences and you just have to go Phew, because you've got to live now yeah. we talk about you live in present time what have you mm. got now and then you and you learn your priorities in life as well i mean as long as you as you get older health is your number one priority you want to be fit and healthy and be able to do things mm -hmm. and then you work from there because that that dictates an awful lot of things you can and can't do mm. and so it gets very simple of what you know you've you think you want to have it, everything in life, but but uh, when you know a lot of material things and value, but when it comes down to, I'm sure a lot of people agree. I mean, I've got a gammy hip right now. It doesn't sound a lot, but I can't blame and play golf. But you know how I want to play golf. I so said that hurts. You know this yeah. sort of thing or whatever. You know, got other bits of your body are not working how they should be, and they and they control in your life, and you have to then, and you have to. Um, Appreciate the moment when you oh have it. My goodness, do you have to bring it when you get up and think mm -hmm. this is going to be feet on the ground? And you've got to, you've got to get up and enjoy. And you've got to enjoy. Mm -hmm. The other great word is you've got to enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you've got to enjoy each day. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you've ever worked a day in your life. I know it's a cliche, but you, it doesn't sound like you've worked a day no, in your never. life. You love it so much. No, I don't. You know, and even, and you, and even TV. When I went into television, you've got to, you've got to enjoy, it and you've got to, and you've got to look after yourself. The same as being a golfer, especially going through the media time as, as well. You've got to look after yourself and you've got to, at the end of the day, you've got to be very honest with yourself and go, you know, was that a good day today? Mm -hmm. you know, what did I, how did I do today? And you go, yeah, I, I'm happy with that. I did this, I did that. You know, I, whatever it was, mm -hmm. I practiced hard or I handled my health self all right or well. And you're the only one who should judge yourself. That's another very... You still set goals like you you, you did. I mean, no, you still no, like in your... No, the... the, the, the um, the great thing about golf um, and the hardest thing after when you stop playing, golf is totally goal orientated, right. isn't it? Totally. You, from the minute you arrive on the range and tip your balls out, even that first wedge shot should have a goal. Oh, there's a flag down to hit it. And so you make 200 goals in a day easily. Are you guys hearing that? Just make sure that we record that part there. Because you know, it, that is, I mean, most players, I, I'm an amateur golfer, you know, seven, eight handicap. I'm not doing that. I don't have a goal on every single shot. I'm, you know, I'm oh, just, I'm going should. through the I motions mean, half yeah, the time. No, no, that's that is that's, a mega that's lesson. The that's the main. If you just have a simple goal and intention, what you're trying to do, then mm -hmm. you get feedback. I mean, and it should, you should be. Uh, I mean, I never had to try to do this. This is, this is, a, I guess, the fortunate thing. The gift. Back to the the practice ground, maybe it, it all came from there. But I can go out there now. And walk out there, and I've got a three on there in my hand, or seven with now. And my, what's my goal? I hope, I, you know, maybe I can hit a fade to five feet. Right. Well, there's my goal. And if I yeah. carve it in the bunker, well, I learn. Or yeah. if I hit it to two, great. And then what do you do? You forget it and keep well, well, you know, forward, you, right? But you put it in the bank. It's, Take this the lesson. And then... thing remembers everything. So, mm -hmm. but all of that is important. So that you know, that's how I, um, I think that it's so important. I love it.